Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Jane the Virgin, Season 1, Episode 20, Chapter 20. In this episode, we have a delightful wrestling motif going throughout this episode. And also, Jane decides she's had enough and she is going for full custody. Damn. I love this for her. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Claire for commissioning this episode. Claire is in the chat. What's up, Claire? I'm so excited to. Claire says, I'm so excited for the next episode of this. And you all, I watched this episode directly after recording on the previous one. And then when I didn't record on it the next week, I was like, oh, because I had been very steady with one, a, like one or two a week. And uh, I checked the schedule and I saw that it was like a month and a half or something. And I was like, are you, oh my God, really? Because it was such a particularly fun episode that I would have been devastated for that break anyway, but I just felt like it was an extra knife in the heart. And then so much time went by that when it was uh, time to watch the episode today, I, I really couldn't recall if I had recorded on this already or not. And I had to go back and look at what I had posted and be like, okay, yeah, this is the next one. Um, and it was like, it had escaped my brain entirely what the like theme was. I remember that there was like a wrestling thing, but I didn't remember exactly how hard they went with it. And on the rewatch, I was just like, oh, this is so great. Like it was just, I, I enjoyed it just as much the second time. So this episode, we start off with, uh, Jane's flashbacks about like the first time that she ever watched a telenovela and just how much the, What's here it is by the time she was a young woman, she was well versed in the language of amnesia and, of course, the concept of recovered memory. And I really love the little scenes they have because the camera is zoomed in on like her mom and abuela, and they are all together on the couch. And then you see her like react to something that's happened and clutch abuela by the shoulder. And I think it's really interesting that in these depictions, Jane tends to be off to the side and Abuela is between her and her mom. I never really like noticed that before, but that seems to be the like set up a lot of the time. And uh, I don't know if there's anything significant to that or if it's just the way that they want to film it so that they can zoom in on her more easily. But uh, I just couldn't help but notice this time specifically. And um, what, had happened at the very end of the last episode is that she had seen Alba had seen her uh, attacker who is Petra's mom. I can't remember her name though. What is, is her name? Helen? Um, I, I'm so sorry you guys, after this amount of time, I'm really lucky that I remember any names, but she all of a sudden upon seeing her face, Magda, thank you, Claire. I don't know where I got Helen from. Um, she suddenly is like flooded with memories of what happened and who did it and how it all went down. And it's the sort of thing that like, yeah, this is definitely a huge trope in telenovelas, but also this can be a thing, you know, total, complete amnesia, eh, less so, but Losing track of what happened, like, right during a traumatic event, that's super, super common. So I was totally willing to roll with this at all. And she is t explaining exactly what all happened. And you can just see that Jane is livid. So when we come back after the cold open, her grandmother is arguing with her and 
saying that she doesn't want to go to the police because of this attack due to, once again, the fact that she is not in the States legally. And this is the kind of thing that's so true, you guys, and it's why, and I'm just going to go on a soapbox just for a tiny second here, but it is why the concept of illegal immigration is so, like, riddled with problems because it makes the people who are desperate to be here so exploitable. And this is the same thing as with sex workers. If you are a sex worker, but you get like beat up or God knows what by a client or even just a regular person who isn't a client you don't really have any recourse because the law is going to try and prosecute you. So it's possible for people to get away with a lot more abuses. And that is why cops will, in particular, go after people who know they don't have the ability to, like, get help and stick up for themselves because they are looked upon in the system as somebody who they themselves, just by being who they are and doing what they do, is a criminal and it's one of those things that is like really frustrating to me because so many people try and they take anti-sex worker stances and claim that it's for the safety of women when actually if you are trying to outlaw sex work which is absolutely 100 percent going to happen anyway you are not helping women's safety you're making it harder for them to get protection so this is something that I just really, it's like close to my heart. And it's why like folks will target women of populations that are more vulnerable because like if they are people who are violent or if they are like sexually violent or murderers, they will go after women that they know won't say anything, won't draw attention to themselves or that society in general just doesn't care about because they were a criminal anyway, so they either got what was coming to them or it's, well, what did they expect is the other one. If you're not going to straight up say they deserved it, you can soften that exact same like feeling by phrasing it slightly differently and be like, well, you've got to take the risks when you get into that sort of situation. And it makes me so, so angry. So this is just infuriating because I truly like sympathize with Abuela and I was feeling, I understood Jane's anger, but I also like, we have seen how completely underhanded both Magda and Petra can be. And I just don't really see something good coming out of this. Like it feels like Jane isn't either Jane is sort of hand waving what she knows Petra's capable of, or she hasn't fully stopped and thought through what she's demonstrated she's capable of. And if a woman is willing already to shove your grandmother down the stairs, that is somebody who is willing to commit murder. And you know that. So if you are aware that she's going to those lengths on the drop of a hat, as it is, I just kind of feel like, you need to take your grandmother's concerns regarding this a little bit more seriously. You know what I'm saying? It just felt like Jane's acting as if her grandmother is, is being difficult and stubborn. And I was thinking she is very right to be uncertain that this is the way to handle it. Because from what we have seen, these people are just completely ruthless. Um, and they're arguing about whether or not to tell her mom. And of course, at this moment, <laughs> Zoe walks in as Jane is trying to say, give her more credit for being level headed, but she comes slamming in and it turns out that she, Rogelio broke up with her and the entire episode centers in with her story around her trying to get Rogelio to forgive her. And this is because of the kiss with Mario, I think his name was. Now, 
There's not a whole lot to say about her storyline here. I'll go through it pretty quickly. She gets really frustrated because in, and this is what I liked about this will come, become clear. She's trying to call, um, Rogelio over and over again. He's not responding to her calls or her texts or anything. And she eventually asks Jane to try and talk to him. And while Jane agrees, she only makes one try. And then after that, she's like, I am not getting in the middle of this. You guys have got to sort this out for yourself, which is definitely fair. I don't think getting involved in anybody's romantic relationship in this way is smart. But especially when it's your mother, that feels like so, so much more messy. So eventually, Jane, uh, when she talks to him, she finds out that he had been cheated on before. And the press caught his wife at the time, I think, coming out of somebody's hotel room. And it was just a huge story. And like, this is something I really have a lot of sympathy for. If you are in the in the spotlight and you are trying to have any sort of like romantic relationship Everything you do all the time is under such a complete microscope. And there are so many folks who decide to either like ship you as if you're fictional characters or they make up like crazy stories about why that you're really together. Like it can't be real or they like take sides about who is the one that's like got the power in the relationship. It's really wild. Like, I'm not super into celebrity relationship stuff. There was this whole thing with Ariana Grande recently, and I didn't even know she was married or anything. Um, But that said, it's the sort of thing that I feel like is, has got to just wear on people, even folks who are pretty well adjusted and used to being in the spotlight. That's got to be such a strain to have to constantly be coping with that. So, Already, you've got this baggage that Rogelio has having been cheated on. And when Jane tries to say it was just a kiss, he's like, that's how it starts. And I'm like, that's not wrong. Like, I mean, just a kiss. Yeah. But also, if you demonstrate that you are, like, willing to forgive easily, then a person who isn't, like, as committed to the relationship may start to wonder what else they can get away with. And there are different personality types at play here. I don't believe that Shamara is that type with Rahelio, but I could see her being that type with somebody that she didn't care about as much, just like kind of trying to push the envelope. And I know this because I have done this. I was definitely like very toxic in this respect where if I was forgiven for one thing, I would sort of be like, all right, well, I know at least that's not the breaking point. And I don't think I was even fully conscious at the time that I was like testing boundaries very deliberately, but that's in retrospect, definitely what I was doing. And I really respect that Rogelio has drawn the line that he has in the last episode when he gets so upset about this kiss, I really felt like Jomara treated it as if, okay, well, if you kiss somebody and I forgive you, then you have to forgive me. But the way that kiss went down and he, and how immediately he told her about it and that he was not the initiator, it was an entirely different vibe. And also, I didn't know about his baggage at the time. So her going into it and just expecting to be forgiven while a part of me did feel like, wow, he's reacting quite hard considering it was just a kiss. Once I found out how he had had his heart broken exactly this way before I, and, and, you know, we know that Zoe has been a player in the past. I was kind of like, huh? Yeah. You know what? I think maybe if she's trying to learn how to not be self-destructive, because the whole episode where she kissed him was about sort of self-sabotage. If that's a real lesson that she wants to learn, him being really firm in that he is not going to forgive this, I think he will eventually, but for now, is a very good lesson to learn that some people you can't toy with like that. 
they have a very firm line and you cross it and that's about it. Now, if he does eventually forgive her, which I think he will do, I think it will have been good for their relationship for him to make it super clear. I am not here to play with you. I am not interested in drama. If you want to like fuck around, then go find out because I am not the one. And I really like that because I think Zo needed a bit of a reality check. I, she can be really immature when it comes to the way that she approaches men. And if she wants something more serious with him, I think she needs to understand that there are going to be people who it's just a kiss. It It's like, yeah, but we had one fight and you like went out and did that right away. Does that mean that every time we get into an argument and every time you're feeling insecure, you're going to go running to somebody else? That's a fair question. So I really like the fact that he is holding her very accountable. And I am hoping if he does forgive her, he doesn't do it too quickly. And that he doesn't apologize for being unreasonable. Because that's my main, like, considering everything... He isn't being unreasonable. And I just also want to say, I keep talking about his baggage and the way that this affects him in particular. But I, I want to say, if you are somebody who doesn't have this baggage and you still draw that line, good. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. But I do think that knowing he's experienced this kind of humiliation and in an extremely public way before is important. Um. So the episode, like, with her, it sort of ends with her coming to see him and say in person that she understands it's over and that she wants him to know that he can safely come and hang out with Jane and still pursue a relationship with her and that Zoe isn't going to get in the way of that or do anything to screw it up. And you can see when she leaves that he's got a look on his face like he is starting to reconsider already, which is why I think that this is probably not going to last for too much longer. Um, and just to tie things up with them, Rahelio winds up being asked to come back to the show, his show, uh, Passions of Santos, because their ratings have plummeted. And he, you guys, there's this scene where he's yelling on the phone with Shamara about how he stayed there to take this ridiculous role in this other show for her. And you get a clip of it. <laughs> i'm so sorry i'm like i'm trying to find the words to describe this so this woman is in space in a spacesuit just floating and he enters the frame and it's just his head in a helmet disembodied <laughs> and it's just floating and he's talking about how he thought he was dead, but thanks to the miracles of, like, modern science, they were able to save him. And then he says something like, oh, I, I heard something over there. And he just, like, gestures with his eyebrows, like, as best he can and asks her to push him in that direction. And she just taps him and sends him flying off screen. And that's the only function she serves. There's like no dialogue. I don't think she has a single line in that scene. All she does is like redirect his disembodied head in a certain way. And that's the scene. And I, that is so humiliating, you guys. I don't know how they, <laughs> it's, it's so dumb. But anyway, so that's the shit that he's been putting up with. And for Passions of Santos to be back and they're bringing him back as El Presidente. And I love that it's like the scene he records of his triumphant return. It says El Presidente on his like driver's license or something. I don't remember if we find out exactly how it's supposed to be that he survived the stabbing. But either way, he washes up on the scene on, on the beach with a button up shirt that's like open a little bit at the chest and soaking wet and he like you know stumbles over to some fisherman asking for help and it's very fun and I'm super happy for him and this writer who got him written off I'm really wondering 
what her deal is going to be now because the whole thing was that she was like sick of dealing with him because her little boy toy had been lying to her about his behavior did she just cave because of ratings did she find out that he wasn't everything that he said was his role like was he not as good as Rogelio at acting or just not holding it down the same way like did he leave I'm really curious what happened with that because just that the ratings went down for her to come personally and bring these cupcakes with his face on them I don't know it feels like there's got to be more to this um <laughs> Lauren says the scenes from the telenovelas are so fun they really are like delightful so all right now we're going to back up and we are going to let's let's talk about Jane and Magda just really in total so Jane she is talking to her mother about the concerns that she has and she finds out that Michael is the one who kept the whole immigration thing from blowing up in their face when Alma Alba was in the hospital and Jane is of course really touched by this and this is the sort of thing like it's exactly timed so that as soon as things blow up with Jane and Raphael she can find out this like touching sweet thing about Michael and that will lead her down the path of wondering if she wants to like maybe rekindle things with him and he's just a better guy than I was giving him credit for et cetera, et cetera. She hasn't said any of that out loud, but it's clearly on her mind and she goes to him asking for help and explains the situation with being pushed down the stairs and everything else. And eventually when Petra hears about this, she confronts her mom I really loved the the way that Petra plays the scene where she asks her mother, did you push her down the stairs? Because Petra's asking her with a very clear, like, please tell me you didn't actually do this sort of energy so that when her mother says, of course I didn't, the immediate willingness of Petra to believe her, she would not have asked any further questions. It's the sort of thing that happens when somebody just doesn't want to face like I had this happen. I was just talking about this with Owen yesterday. I got caught in the bathroom with my boyfriend in high school. We had just finished having sex. We got caught by a librarian and we were just dressed enough and the lights in the bathroom were out that when she turned them on, we had been like able to pull apart from each other and get our clothes in some semblance of order. And she like called me into her office the next day to talk about it and was like, I, I, you know, I, I felt like I needed to discuss with you. And she like alluded to that. Maybe we were having sex, but she didn't say the words. And I, she was in so much agony, you guys, like her, she was so awkward. She didn't want to be doing this. It just felt like she had to, it was her responsibility, but you could tell she didn't want to be doing this at all. And so I jumped in and told her that we weren't having sex, that we were in there because we had just had a fight and we were arguing. And when I tell you that this desperate bitch just seized on that and went, Oh good. Okay. Okay. Well, is everything okay now? Okay, great. Well, then never mind. And she practically threw me a parade to get me out the door again. And this was like 100% the energy that Petra had in this scene where she was going to be more than willing to take her mother's word for it. And then Magda has to like continue and be like, but for instance, let's say I did push her. And all of a sudden you can see Petra's whole face fall as she realizes. And what's so gross about this is that Petra's mother has been lying to her for years about her disability. And Petra still decides to take her side in this whole thing, despite knowing that her mother did indeed do this. And I just really want her to be willing to throw her mother to the wolves. Like her mom is saying, I, I wanted to keep you away from Milos because he's a monster. And like, I don't know that she's wrong about that. If Milos was out here willing to throw acid at all, 
then probably he is a monster. That's not a normal behavior, you know? And we saw the way that he blew up any time that, he, that Petra said something he didn't like. So I'm willing to believe Magda when she says that he is an abusive piece of shit and she needed to get away from him. But also, it's very abusive to pretend you had a disability for three years and, like, low-key blame her for it. And put her in the position of like lying about abuse from her husband and everything to get money that you're making her feel guilty. Like she owes you, you know? So anyway, it just bummed me out so much to see how quickly Petra was willing to like roll with this story about how Magda had to be mistaken. And eventually as Michael is investigating, they, they like, can't prove anything. The whole thing with like seeing the guy in the room and hearing him calling for help. They say she couldn't have seen anybody. And it was just the telenovela we were watching. Eventually when Rogelio is talking about how the paparazzi are always taking pictures, that's when Jane has the idea that maybe somebody took a photo of the outside of their room that night and caught something. And she manages to find a photo that has uh, I can't remember his name, but, you know, their bearded prisoner, it has him in the window pretty clearly visible. And so when he goes to Petra with this photo, she has to get in touch with this guy really quickly and get him to agree to a story that he is her plumber and they get fake business cards made. And this dude comes in and interviews with Michael about how he really is a plumber. Like that's why he was in the room because she called him. And it's really puzzling because if he were being kept prisoner, why would he assist her with this whole story? And so they wind up having to drop it. And Petra even gets fake medical records through Milos that attest to her mother having had a surgery and that she was unable to walk at the time that she allegedly pushed Alba down the stairs. So that really took it over the top for me was the fake medical records. And because she has these records, it really puts the doubt in uh, Raphael's mind. And, you know, she says to her mother at one point that she is still in love with him and that she is going to try and get him back. So what she is doing here is not only like, I'm trying to keep myself from, you know, being related to a person who is a potential murderer and a liar, but also I am going to try and make it look like Jane's family is the unreliable one in this scenario and that way it will drive a wedge between the two of you and that's what i think and it works apparently because the end of the episode sees jane at like at the hotel talking to rogelio and jane had been doing her best really to co-parent with him the way that she felt she needed to. So we see at the start of the episode, her and Rogelio at one of their appointments at the doctor. And Jane has found out that the baby is breech. And when he is asking like some really obvious questions, she gets pretty irritated because she has asked him to like read the material that she gave him several times i'm trying to get to the part where she says that um let's see uh sorry i'm just i forgot about this whole Raphael knew things between them would settle get better with time and he says i just want what's best for your for the baby and she says i'm sorry can you just stop talking you just broke up with me yesterday it's kind of hard i just need some time and this is when the doctor comes in um, and tells them that everything looks good except for the baby being breech. And when she says that, he says breech. And she, Jane interrupts. He didn't read the book. I mean, in his defense, I only asked him to do it three times. 
I really felt her in this moment. I really did. Like, dude, breach isn't even like a niche term. You know, that's the sort of thing that if you've done any research on pregnancy at all, that word is going to likely come up as like one of the more common complications. And the fact that he keeps insisting that he's committed to the business on behalf of the baby, but he's putting zero effort into understanding what's happening with the pregnancy and what all they're going to do once the baby is here in terms of like childcare and his involvement with that. I am so over Raphael. I really, really am. So his, the look on his face at this point, like you can see that he is ashamed of himself. He is, he has no defense here. And later when they come back, they get the news that the baby is still breech, but he knows the terminology and he has made some effort to read up, which is just wild. It's like, just, this is the thing that gets me so frustrated is that a lot of men are the, this exact sort of way where they'll be asked to do something. And the only thing that motivates them is shame over being outed to others that they haven't done their job. And when I say this, I'm not just talking like, this is one of those that I have seen talked about by so many women. I can't even name them all. There's something that needs doing around the house. And the man who is supposed to be the handyman of the house for reasons of toxic masculinity, that is, that's just his job, whether he's good at it or not, he has to do it. And there's a job that needs doing, and he insists he's the one to take care of it, but he doesn't repeatedly for weeks, doesn't. And these women that I am referring to called in help. Whether that be an uncle, a father, a male friend, those are the worst, and tell their husband, it's okay, so-and-so did it. You just seemed really busy. And then all of a sudden, your man is on his shit for the next, like, several months because he is so shamed that another man had to come into his territory and take care of the business that he was supposed to take care of. And with me and Owen, this is not so much an issue because like he isn't really that good with that stuff and he knows that he isn't. So a lot of times I tend to take care of it, but this is a tactic that I have seen used. I'm telling you at least 30 times in different relationships. And the fact that his wife, the woman that he is like allegedly meant to care for and build a home with she asking him to do this and, and repeatedly reminding him that didn't have any impression on, on him at all. It was nagging. But when it's another man coming in and being like, well, I did it because obviously you were never going to do what you needed to do and take care of your responsibilities. That external shame is what gets them moving. And this moment, if she had been alone and been like, I can't believe that you haven't read the book and the doctor wasn't in there, I don't know that it would have gotten him as bad. But she says this to him in front of the doctor. And I feel like that was what drove the extra nail into the coffin and made him go, I guess I better fucking do this. So the next scene there together, he's made the effort to read it. But I can't help but feel like that's like too little too late, my guy. Yeah, you did the reading. She's like, how far along at this point? And you still haven't discussed, like, doing any child care yourself. All you want to do is give her money for someone else to do it, not handling your shit. So once she gets the baby to turn and she does all kinds of wild shit to do this. She plays music to her, her belly. She does the elephant walk along the ground, which looks like really hard, actually. That looks like it would be a lot of core strength. It's almost being in like do downward dog, but trying to walk. Um, the thing that really sends her over the edge with him 
is she has a this like incense that is supposed to be burned by her feet to help the baby breach. And apparently this is a real thing, the narrator says. I don't know anything about it. But she has this setup where she's clamping the incense in her curling iron because there's nobody to like hold it. And she accidentally lights the blanket on fire because she's got, for some reason, an extremely flammable blanket under the incense, which Jane would never. I understand what we're meant to be showing during this scene. And I'm not trying to say that Jane is incapable of making mistakes. She is. But they wanted it to be a very dramatic mistake for the sake of like, oh, what about her safety? And I just don't see Jane leaving a blanket under an open flame in any sense. It's fine, though. I'm going to let it go. But I'm just saying that I think it's character assassination. So luckily, her abuela comes in the room just as that shit lights up and is like, what the hell has gotten into you? And Jane breaks down. And you guys, this acting, she was so good. She got me so teary eyed because she's just like, I have to do this by myself. And I'm trying to prove that I can do this because I am a single mother and this is not what I planned on. And I am trying to like figure it out. I have to be able to do things by myself. And the panic in her voice and the heartbreak over the fact that everything that she had has tried to make her life into isn't going the way it's it should. I just felt it in my soul, you know, like she keeps attempting to do the right thing and be as smart as she can in her approach to stuff. And it just blows up in her face over and over. So at the end of the episode, she is putting flowers in vases when uh, Raphael walks into the room and he is trying to make her feel better by telling her that Magda has been fired, that he told Petra to fire her and get her a job somewhere else. And he really thinks he did something here. But Jane's reaction is, okay, and what about Petra? When is she out? And he's like, what? Petra's part owner of the hotel. She's not going anywhere. And Jane is like, well, her and her mother are lying about the fact that her mom tried to murder my grandmother. She tried to kill a person on your property, by the way. I don't want to be around either one of them. And I sure fucking don't want the child to be around them. And then suddenly he's out here being like, well, there's two sides to every story. And the, the whole way her posture changes when he says that she's such a good actress i just gotta like give her real props here she like straightens and intakes her breath and tightens her grip on the flowers and looks at him with a real like did i just fucking hear that right because nobody ever says there's two sides to a story when they believe your story That's not what they mean, literally ever. It's them saying, well, probably you did something or probably you got something wrong or don't really understand the context or whatever. And we know that he has these like false medical records. So I'm trying to give him a break because the lengths that Petra has gone to to prove that her mother could not walk are truly the kinds of lengths one would think nobody would go to. 
it's so far that when he asks Jane, do you think she's been faking her disability for three years? And Jane says, yes, which Magda has been doing. But when she says yes, it sounds nuts. Like he's not wrong. It sounds crazy because that is a crazy thing to do. And that's what's so frustrating when people do extreme things is that when you then try and tell a person, you sound like the unhinged one who's completely out of touch with reality because what person would go to those lengths? But that's the whole thing is that a ruthless, like devoid of morals person who only cares about their own well-being and survival, that's the type of person who would do it. And that's what she's accusing Magda of being. And that's exactly what he doesn't believe. And I really want to get Raphael to stop and consider the fact that he was being accused of beating his wife and he knew he did no such thing. And she was full on ready to go to court and like ruin his reputation because of this. But he's been getting along with Petra so well recently with them both trying to manage the business that he is giving her a lot more slack than she deserves because it feels like things are patched up and like she's maybe really changed. And he's not stopping to consider the type of person that would do that. And he's also not stopping to think about who gave her the black eye. If it was Magda, that says something about her too. Like, did he think Petra gave herself the black eye? What does he think happened there? Does he think it was makeup? Like, so Raphael taking Petra's word over Jane's, that's really what it comes down to. I understand that the records he's given and that feels super compelling, but what it really boils down to is you are taking one person's word over another person's word. And one of those people has proven to be repeatedly untrustworthy. She cheated on you. She was setting you up in a variety of ways. She went behind your back on like several deals. She is so untrustworthy that the fact that you can still work together at all is really kind of amazing. And I had this sort of like, argument with Owen way at the beginning of our relationship, there was somebody we were both friends with who did something pretty shitty and he didn't unfriend this person. And I remember I was like joking around with Rashawn via text about them. And it turned out that he was still like, enough on that person's side that when he saw that I was like mocking them to Rashawn, he got pissed on their behalf and was like, wow, what do you mean girls in high school? And I had to stop and be like, hold on a second. You're telling me that you are defending her after everything that she did and the repeated screenshots and all of this evidence, you are mad that I'm mocking her privately to a friend via text. That's the thing you're mad about. And it was like, what it came down to was, have you ever seen me just like mocking somebody because I like, am jealous of them or have some sort of like petty rivalry. I would not be doing this if she weren't a bad person who did something really hurtful, not just to me, but to like her family. And I have kept quiet on a lot of that shit and I didn't need to because I am not trying to ruin anybody's life. So that should really go to show that I am not here just for the pettiness, because I could have been petty. And I just decided to unfriend and cut them out and move on with my life, because that was what the right thing to do was. And I got, I was so hurt by the fact that 
not only was he standing up for her, but when I went on Facebook, I saw that they were still friends. And I, w I had to sit down with him and be like, I cannot believe that you and I have been together this long and you are not willing to take my word on this. Do I go around telling you to unfriend people? Has that literally ever happened? Did you see what went down yourself? No. So you're telling me you don't believe me. That's what it, what you're saying. You believe this internet friend that you've never actually met and not me, the woman that you claim to want to get married to. Explain. Because that's, it's a simple equation. And when I put it in those terms, I could see he was really shaken. Like he didn't think of it in those black and white simple terms. But that's all it is, is whose word are you taking and why are you willing to believe one over the other? What is it that you think you know that the other person either doesn't know or isn't being honest with you about? Because that's like a pretty serious accusation. And he doesn't tell Jane that he has these medical records and I kind of wanted to say, for him to say it so that she could point out, oh, where did you get those? From Petra? Yeah, that's interesting. You don't think that's significant? Okay. Well, I guess that tells me a lot about your intelligence and your critical thinking in this situation. Good to know. I really wanted, but he can't, he doesn't say it because she would definitely point that out. And that's what I really like about Jane as a character is the writers know that she is smart and they know that she would like go for logic in certain situations. So they just like, don't give her the opportunity because she does research and she does use logic. And she, it's not that she's not an emotional person, but she is able to, after a time, set aside her emotional response and be logical about something and like honest with herself about her motivations. So this whole thing with him and how he reacted to her, I was just so disgusted because really, sir, I know that you want a good working relationship with Petra because it makes your life easier. But in total, what he keeps doing is putting work and, and his relationships regarding work of, ahead of Jane. So this whole thing also, like the, the investigation is punctuated by Michael, of course, finding out that Jane and Raphael are splits. And when he says, I'm so sorry, and she says, are you? He says, yes, I am, because he's the father of your child. And I imagine that would be really hard for you. It's the right thing to say. I'm not sure how much he means it, but he pulls it off in that moment. And then she walks away and Raphael is just standing there staring him down. And Michael just kind of like quirks his mouth just a little. And I was like, I'm not mad at you, Michael. You are a shit too. Don't get me wrong. I'm not team Michael. But I'm so irritated with Raphael at this point that Michael just getting to sort of give him the finger for a second felt pretty good. Like, that's what you deserve, Raphael. And so then let's get into the whole wrestling thing, because this is so great. So Raphael's sister is back from Peru. I think she said she, did she say she went to an ashram in Peru? I feel like. And Luisa has a new girlfriend because like, uh, of course, just as we were all wondering, Raphael is thinking she went and met up with Rosa down there. And she's like, the woman murdered our dad. Of course I didn't. And I kind of was like, I don't know. Like, maybe you did, though. But she has hooked up with a woman uh, who is a professional wrestler named Juice. She goes by Juice. Juicy Jordan, I think, is the name she wrestles under. Uh, first of all, God, that is like, this woman is so jacked. Oh, y'all, I need to get my, my life together. When I see women that are like muscular and strong like this, that look like not only, it's not even about 
being thin and attractive. They look vital. You know what I mean? They look like they can live. And I'm just like, man, I really need to figure this out. I need to get it together. But she walks up. The two of them are all over each other. It is so funny. And um, Louisa comes up with an immediate business idea because she's sort of like dangling her vote. She wants her shares back. And she wants to dangle her vote on whether they should take out another loan to cover the expenses of the Marbella. She's using Petra and Raphael against each other by making it seem as if the two of them each, like whoever agrees with her schemes will get her vote. And it turns out later she's fully aware that's what she's doing. She's very good at playing dumb in the moment and like acting unconscious, but this has all got a motivation behind it. So she suggests this melee at the Marbella and they both agree to it, even though they do not want to, because they want her to support their vote. And the melee, it's so good, you guys, because as that is the backdrop, we get the, like, the costumed, named main characters. And I'm trying to remember what each of them is, because I, I, I would have to jump to specific spots in the episode in order to be able to see them. Um, but the, the way that the camera, like that each of them is coming in, in a still image, uh, with the name superimposed over them in this like really wild costume. And it's so much fun to watch. So Raphael is the hot tellier. Uh, I, I can't remember what Petra's name is. Jane is the pregnant punisher michael is dangerous detective and i can't remember if there's any is it just those four i think it was just those four but the two of them like are going <laughs> she's calling her a liar uh oh the cold warrior that's what it is and she <laughs> when they are in the ring together at one point the hit that she delivers to Jane is described as the Eastern block. I know that these are like, that these jokes are probably so overdone in wrestling, you know, but as somebody who's not into wrestling, they're very fresh and amazing to me. Like it's just very, very good. Uh, she does the belly bump and gets her in the face with her stomach is delightful. I love this whole thing so, so much. Um, and I really like, I'm, I'm sure that because this is a wrestling episode, this is going to be the only time that we see this, but I would not be mad if they made this a recurring thing where we get to see the, like, you know, wrestling names and costumes and whatnot come back. It would be really, really fun. So the, the way that this like wrestling subplot, I already mentioned that Louisa knew what she was doing when finally uh, Raphael admits like, we're both just trying to get you to vote on our side. That's why we're each agreeing with you on each thing. Cause she, her suggestion is like, maybe we should make this a monthly thing or a weekly thing. She's pushing at him and trying to get him to like admit we're full of shit. And he finally does. And she is so gratified, very relieved. So once he admits that's what's going on, he says, you don't understand. I need the hotel to succeed. I've given up so much for it. And she's like, what do you mean? What have you given up? And he finally blurts out that he gave up Jane and we get a little sequence that sort of like jumps ahead in time where it's clear he has explained to her the whole situation, everything with Jane meeting his mom, the whole bit. And when we come back to them, Louisa is like, dude, look, I get that you've made a lot of sacrifices and I do respect that, but I have to tell you, 
you sacrificed the wrong thing. Like, what are you doing? She is the woman you love. And he leaves a message for Jane at one point where it, it's clear he, he almost said, I love you and stops himself. He still loves her. But you're sacrificing her and your unborn child that you claim all of this is for. You're putting both of their welfare at risk by just abandoning them, really. And for why? So he starts to realize I've got to get serious about telling Petra to fire her mom. Well, when he goes down and tells Jane, that's what he did. And then she asks, well, when's Petra going? And he pushes back on that. Jane has reached a conclusion here. And she's like, I don't want my kid around this. And you know what? My kid doesn't have to be around this. I'm going to remove myself from the situation. I quit. And Raphael tells her, you know that I will still work here. I will be working with Petra. Even if you quit, that's not solving the problem. That's not fixing anything. And he isn't making the point he means to make. Because what he's trying to say is don't quit. That isn't going to solve things. We'll find another way. But what she's hearing is not only will do you have to quit, you are going to have to find a way to keep him and all of his bullshit away from your kid. So she goes home and she talks to her mom and her grandma and tells them, all right, look, things are about to get pretty tough. I am going to really, really need your help, but I am going for soul custody because his ex-wife is a fucking lunatic. Her mother is an attempted murderer. And Raphael doesn't believe me about the dangers that they pose. God knows the other things that they are capable of. So I am going to keep my kid the fuck out of this drama. And I'm going to need you two to support me. I am so proud of her. Just for the record, I don't think she's wrong at all. The toxic environment there, like, yeah, get your kid out of there. I fully support this. I am just really worried how this is going to work out. Because, like, contrary to what many men's rights activists will have you believe, women don't get favored in custody battles the way that they once did. There was a, there was a time where women were favored heavily because of traditional gender roles making it seem as if women are just naturally better caregivers but in recent years men who sue for custody more often than not are given custody they tend it's like the thing that they don't talk about is that men don't sue for custody very often it just doesn't happen a lot of the time men are very willing to either completely abdicate or have joint custody and put in minimal effort when they have the kids. Guys, the stories I have been hearing again, very recently in relationship to something that I won't get into that's personal, the number of men who take infants for their like custody over the weekend and return the infant in the same diaper that they left with. It's high. It's a really large number, extremely fucked up. Don't even get me started. But anyway, men don't often sue for custody in the first place. And when they do, they usually get it. So we're in a battle here where she wants full custody. And I'm assuming he would have to counter suit for full custody himself. Or the minimum would be joint. But I don't know how that would even work out with the sort of like I don't know the, the ins and outs of the way a case like this could be settled. And if she were to go up against a man who has as much money and resources as he does, not only to pay for his lawyers and his like legal team that he would probably get in place, but also to pay for the care of the child, 
when she doesn't really have a steady income. She has a household with family that could help, but one of those family members is illegal. And I don't know if that would be something that could be used against her or would come up at all. And the other is somebody who is in an on again, off again romance with a like superstar that could potentially not look great too. And all of this is like happening because Jane got pregnant by accident due to a medical, what is it? I keep wanting to call it medical malpractice, which like it, it was um, medical error, I think is the word that Jane used. But with that being the reality of it, I don't know what, like how strong a case Raphael would have or that she would have. It, it feels to me like when I've heard the way that certain suits get decided, I'm surprised by the factors that get taken into account sometimes. So I, I'm really curious about how this is going to go for her. I think she's doing the right thing. I don't think she's being vindictive at all. I think that probably there's an element of that in the fact that he didn't believe her. But I really think that it's one of those rare occasions where doing the right thing and feeling vindictive just dovetail nicely into the same solution. And I really think that she's afraid for her kid because she's in a position where this man doesn't believe her in the face of a woman who has lied to him a million times. And do you want to have a child growing up with a parent that is that easily snowed by those around him? What else would he not believe? What if his kid came to him with somebody that had like, you know, hurt them somehow? Is he just not going to believe the kid too? Like he's got questionable judgment for sure. I really wonder if he's ever going to find out that Magda was lying about her disability. Like, is that, I've already talked about like the cameras in the hall on the day that she pushed Alba down the stairs, but that's never come up. So I'm going to assume that there aren't cameras. I don't know. I feel like they've mentioned that there are cameras in certain hallways because he saw he, there are cameras in the hallways because he saw Louisa on the camera. Like, um, did he see her leaving? Oh yeah. She, he saw her leaving his father's hotel room, but he didn't put it together that she was having an affair with Rosa. So I don't remember what he thought Louisa was doing, but there was definitely a capture on camera on one of the hotel floors. So, you know, this is the sort of thing that happens when you introduce the fact that there are security cameras in certain areas. It becomes a little bit of a plot hole if they don't get brought up again. Eh, you know, questionable thing to do. I don't know if it is going to come up and nobody's thought of it yet or what, but I feel like maybe we could explore that. Anyway, this was a really, really good episode. And I just, I, the, the, when Jane talks to Magda and Magda is like, well, I looked up your grandma and nothing came up. So maybe she's not here legally. The woman who plays Magda is so good at being a hateful cunt. Like you just fucking despise her. I was looking at her like, I'm so glad you got that big scar on your face. I hate you. Like I, I, I wish somebody else would throw acid at you. It's fucked up, but it's true. I do not like her. And the, the way that she's threatening this woman with deportation, it's so ugly. Like, Ew. Oh, I hated it so much. And the rage that Jane, she, again, with her acting, she's so good. Her, she gets like this flushed look and her eyes get glassy the way that they do when you are about to cry. But you know how that happens when you're that angry, that your anger is like somewhat spurred by complete disbelief of what you're hearing. And so you get teary eyed because you're like, so infuriated and frustrated because you're helpless. There's nothing that you can do in that situation. So you start crying as a release for your utter frustration. And she doesn't actually cry in the scene, but she gives the impression of somebody who is barely holding it together while this woman talks to her. She's so good. Anyway, I got to wrap up, but I really, really like this episode. Can't wait to watch the next one. Um, I'm not sure when the next installment is. Let me see what we've got here. Uh, what's today? The 1st of August. Oh my God, it's August. Jesus, this whole year has gone by so fast. Um, the next one's on the 17th. Yay. So not too, too much longer. So yeah. All right, guys. Well, I will see you here then. 
And thank you again, Claire, for commissioning this. Until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers.